Good afternoon. It's great to be here, and I'm honored to be, uh, have been invited by the Heartland Institute to speak at this great conference. Uh, and I want to thank James in the back, James Taylor, and Joe Bass. Joe, if you're watching, uh, get well soon. Uh, I, I, sh I, I want to start with a confession. Jim Lakely told all the speakers Wednesday night, don't say anything if you're asked by a reporter about the Heartland Institute. Refer those questions to James and Jim. And by the way, be sure not to talk to Suzanne Goldenberg of The Guardian. So well, I'm, I'm sort of a contrarian by nature and, and upbringing. So of course, the first thing I did uh, yesterday morning was uh, record an interview with Suzanne Goldenberg uh, about the Heartland Institute. <laughs> And I want to tell you what I told her. I said, I was at the first conference, and it was great, and they've only gotten better and better. So I hope you'll forgive me. <laughs> now, at the first Heartland Conference, which was not nearly a decade ago, it was in 2008, uh, I uh, spoke about what I thought the situation was politically and what needed to be done. And I laid out a strategy for dealing with what was on the agenda at the time, which was the possibility that the Congress would enact cap and trade legislation in the next Congress and that a Democratic president would be elected in 2008, later in the year, and would sign it in the next Congress. And that the Copenhagen Accord at the end of 2009 would result in a successor to the failed Kyoto Protocol. Well, uh, things have changed since then. And so I want to sort of summarize what's happened and then give some ideas about what needs to be done. Let me begin with a little background. In 1992, President George Bush flew back from the Rio Earth Summit with the document in his hand that he had just signed, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Conservative Republican senators had spent months trying to talk him and the White House into not going to Rio and not signing the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. He did it. He came back and he said, and the White House said dismissively and scornfully and condescendingly to all of those Republican senators who were led by somebody I later worked for, Malcolm Wallop of Wyoming, said, you see, it was a great triumph because we signed this treaty and it has nothing mandatory in it, it's just voluntary action. That was absolutely wrong false, it's turned out as the conservative critics said it would. The UN Framework Convention on Climate Change put a noose around the world's economy, and it has been left to later years to decide how quickly and how far to tighten that noose. And of course, it has been up to us, many of you in the room have been involved, to try to resist that tightening. So far, I would say, you know, just in general, the results haven't been too bad yet. We haven't strangled the world economy yet. We've just slowed it down. Now, the things that have happened since then are, in 1997, Kyoto was negotiated, the protocol, which was going to put mandatory energy rationing targets on the world's developed economies, not the world's developing economies. And luckily for us, the Clinton-Gore administration in the person of Al Gore so, so overreached that the Kyoto Protocol was dead on arrival. Now, this is, to describe what I think needs to be done, I am now going to just sort of digress and tell you what I think the nature of the global warming movement is. Because there's a lot of talk about this, but I don't think there's any very deep analysis or real understanding. So before I discuss what needs to be done about the current issues, I want to say something about the movement. Uh, many people have started calling global warming a religion. 
Uh, I don't think that's very useful or revealing or helpful. I mean, for example, Nigel Lawson in his little book, A Call to Reason, calls it a religion. And by the way, I think that's a very unfortunate title for his book, but it is the best little book on climate policy and, and what we ought to be doing to, to uh, resist the, the alarmists. But of course, there is some overlap. I mean, global warming is a system of belief, and it, like religion, religious belief, it's not empirically disprovable. But let me suggest two other ways, and I think there are several others, but let me suggest what I think are the two best ways to approach what the global warming movement is and what its goals are. The first is uh, Bruce Yandel's famous Baptists and Bootleggers Coalition. And of course, this is that at, in supporting dry laws against uh, alcohol uh, sales, uh, the, the bootleggers would essentially get the Baptists to be the front men because the Baptists would have the moral argument it's, you shouldn't drink, it's bad, temperance is good, and the bootleggers would supply the money and the, the, the kind of muscle, and they would work together to keep various counties and states dry. And I think this is a very powerful uh, explorator, uh, explanatory tool. You've got the people who have the moral message, the moral high ground. In the, this Baptist and Bootleggers Coalition, a good example would be Al Gore. He keeps saying this is a moral issue. And then you have the people who are going to profit from these energy rationing policies, and, and they put up the money, and they hope to get rich off it. And a good example of this is Al Gore. Um, so, and by the way, academics are deeply involved in the Baptists and Bootleggers Coalition because they uh, are seeking advancement, preferment, prestige. And so a lot of third, fourth, fifth-rate scientists have gotten a long ways on the basis of this movement and this kind of, uh, well, I don't, I, don't, I don't want to call it a fraud. Uh, I will say more about that in a minute. I, I would just say about this Baptists and Bootleggers Coalition, it's really ironic that currently the biggest Baptist is Pope Francis. <laughs> Another way to look at the the global warming movement is to consider what they're trying to accomplish. Uh, they are trying to create an alternative reality. Now, I, I think this is often brought up in, in one way or another by people who are criticizing them, but let me just give you three examples of this alternate reality that they're trying to create. We now see that the models and the temperature data conflict. So to, to maintain this alternate reality, we have to prefer the models to the facts. And then if, that, if people start to get suspicious, we then have to change the facts, change the data, adjust the data. Another example is that in, in current global warming argumentation, the, the effects precede the causes. So we haven't had any temperature increase, and yet the portents and omens are all around us. More storms, more floods, more droughts, more plagues of locusts. And so this is this kind of reality. Uh, Mark mentioned the Lysenkoism and, and, uh, and, and uh, airbrushing people out of uh, history in the Soviet Union, out of photographs. That was an attempt to create an alternate reality, and it eventually collapsed. Uh, but, you know, uh, for example, Fred Smith, my, uh, the founder of CEI, always says, you know, uh, Stalin was really excited about the uh, grape, when Grapes of Wrath was made into a movie and he wanted to show it all over Russia uh, to show the, the sufferings of the depression. But then after they started showing it, they immediately withdrew it because it was actually subversive of the alternate reality that they had created in the Soviet Union because everybody saw that even the poorest Oki owned an old jalopy. <laughs> so this is the kind of uh, alternate reality. It's a very delicate thing to maintain. It's very difficult. And that, that explains, I think, why uh, anybody who s says the emperor has no clothes is viciously attacked. Suggest we prosecute them, put them in prison, have Nuremberg trials. RICO investigations, that kind of thing. It's because you, you can't have anybody outside of this alternate reality just pointing out to people, hey, this is, this is all a mirage. Uh, another example of the, the nature of the alternate reality is that they always say 
that the impacts are incredibly bad, but the costs of turning the global economy upside down and inside out are minimal, or will even make a profit. Al Gore said, we want to replace expensive, dirty energy with clean, free energy. And that is where we uh, see these people. They actually think people are going to believe that because of the kind of alternate reality that they're creating. So it is a very de delicate and difficult business. Now, I just want to say one thing. Where does this come from? It comes from the new left. It comes from the Frankfurt School, what has been called cultural Marxism. Herbert Marcuse was the most famous uh, proponent of it in the United States in the 50s and 60s. Uh, it, uh, what, what the Frankfurt School said was, well, the proletariat is no good making the revolution because capitalism has filled their bellies and they, are no, long, they no longer realize that they're alienated. And if they don't realize that they're alienated, they now have false consciousness. So who has to prosecute and, and affect the revolution? It's the intellectuals, the experts. And so uh, I think you'll see uh, that the new left led directly to the environmental movement. Uh, many of the people in the new left, uh, after the new left collapsed, became environmentalists. They became some other things as well. But a lot of them became environmentalists. And they really do believe in the the reign of experts, because experts can bring about the creation of this alternate reality. They have the secret knowledge to do it, and they have the secret knowledge to, to create it. And, and this is a, obviously a form of Gnosticism. Now, what is to be done? Where are we today? Well, in 2009, we were faced with cap and trade and the Copenhagen Accord. Both of those failed. Today, instead, we have the forthcoming Paris Accord, and we have these EPA regulations on greenhouse gas emissions from new and existing power plants. The problem we face is that cap and trade took Congress to pass, to enact. And the American people have a, a certain amount of influence on the Congress. When the House of Representatives, in, on June 23, 2000, Nine passed the Waxman-Markey cap-and-trade bill by 218 to 212 votes. They went home for the 4th of July week-long recess. When they got back, the, the, the response from the American public was so overwhelmingly negative, even in liberal districts, that when they got back, Senator Harry Reid, who had said that they would take up cap-and-trade in July and pass it and send it to the president before the August recess, Harry Reid announced that there was a change of plans. They would now take up on the Senate floor the less contentious issue of health care reform. <laughs> well, we don't have the Congress now uh, to, to enact something. The Congress has to block something. The Republican Congress does want to block these power plant rules, but it's very difficult. And let me just say very briefly, and I, I, Nathan, I may go over one minute because I've got, I've got three more points to make. Um, There are the courts. Many people say, well, these rules are clearly illegal. We can go to the courts and we can get them overturned. Uh, Christopher Monckton uh, believes that because he won a case in British courts about Al Gore's movie. Well, British courts are not American courts, and he won a case against a private individual, not against the government. So I, I really don't trust the courts. The states can resist, but at some point the states will be bought off. So it's really up to Congress. Well, Senator Mitch McConnell wants, wants to block these rules. Uh, Senator Inhofe wants to block them. The House leadership wants to block them. But it's very difficult because the president can veto bills. Senate Democrats can filibuster bills and not allow them to come to the floor. So it's going to be hard. The other thing is the the uh, Paris Accord upcoming in December. And these two are related, and that's why I bring it up before I finish talking about what Congress needs to do. The president wants to negotiate a new treaty to replace the Kyoto Protocol that will, in some 
some strange fashion commit the United States to his plan to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but will not be legally binding and therefore not subject to Senate ratification. And so they keep dancing around what the form of this agreement can possibly be that can achieve these, what seem to be incongruous goals. So what the Congress must do, whether they can pass anything to block the power plant rules or not, they need to keep sending signals to the world, to the international negotiators and other heads of state, that Obama has no, no ability to do what he says he's going to do. And by the way, these rules, people, people, uh, people keep going on about these rules being kind of the end of the world and uh, they'll kill the coal industry and so on. But remember, for the EPA and for the environmental movement and for President Obama, these are just the start of the rules that are necessary to save the world from global warming. So the utilities think, well, if we can, if we can improve this rule a little and we can improve that a little and we can get more time to deal with it, we'll be able to live with these rules. No, you can't because there's a new wave coming and then there's another wave. And that's, and that's because maintaining an alternate reality requires constant movement. You cannot maintain this bubble by just achieving one, one interim goal. You have to get to the final, the final position, which is to turn out the lights all around the world. So the forces of darkness will not be defeated by uh, just defeating these rules. This week, the House Appropriations Committee introduced a bill, which they will mark up, which does not, it's the State Department Appropriations Bill, it does not include any funding for the proposed Green Climate Fund. President Obama had asked for $500 million. The promise is that by 2020, is that correct? The world's developed countries will provide $100 billion per year to the developing countries to pay for turning out the lights. So, if, they, if he can't even get $500 million, how is he gonna get 20 or 30 billion per year or the next president? So this is a very strong signal if we can maintain this. So here's what we need to do. You need to sit down with your elected representatives in Congress and the Senate and explain to them that this is not about just one vote or about getting one thing right. You, we need some people who will pursue this over time, and this is very difficult for elected, uh, uh, for legislators, to, uh, particularly on the right, on the, uh, Republicans and conservatives. We need to pursue these, uh, uh, opposite, we need to pursue opposing these policies in every possible way for as long as it takes until we've stopped the forces of darkness. Thank you.